I V M. The king watches the walls with cold, calculating eyes. As far as walls go, they're not very impressive. Earth has been piled up onto ramparts and wooden palisades have been constructed on top. Here and there are bastions where groups of archers stand, bearing the banners and standards of the many Ganarajyas of the Gangetic Plains, united in defiance of the king. In front of the walls is a wide ditch filled with water. The rotting bodies of the king's soldiers float in the fetid liquid, buzzing with flies. Corpses scatter the wide open areas in front of the city. There were once homes there, but they have long since been abandoned by fleeing people and then burned and trampled by the king's army. The king, sitting on his elephant, looks behind him at those of his soldiers who still survive. Almost every one that he can see bears some or the other wound, some bandaged, others festering. Their clothes are splattered with mud and old blood. The common soldiers, summoned from the rice fields and small villages of his land of Magadha, refuse to meet his eyes. His personal guard, wearing once fresh turbans, watch him with anger and resentment. They think he has failed. They wish only to return home to their families. He speaks a command and his mahout kicks the elephant. The great beast begins to slowly amble forward. Quickly, a detachment of Magadhan foot soldiers gets in front of them as they advance. Further, further, just out of range of their enemy's wicked bows. Vajes, for months you have defied me. My army is vast and determined. You've killed many of my men. Their brothers are thirsting for revenge. Surrender to me now and I may yet have mercy on you. I won't go hunt down your leaders and your women and children. I leave the Mallas and the Kosalans alive. Hell, I will even spare the Lichavis. But you must surrender. That is a desperate lie. The king knows that the monsoons are near and he will have to retreat soon or risk missing the sowing time or worse, risk being trapped by the flooding rivers. But he has come so close to defeating his enemies once and for all that he shudders at the thought of yet more agonizing campaigns, months spent in recruiting, training, equipping, months spent in risky battle after risky battle. He waits now, watching like an eagle for the enemy's reply. The battlefield is silent. Thunder rumbles through the overcast skies. A gentle rain begins to fall. There's some activity on the ramparts. Are they discussing his proposition? The king tries to squint through the raindrops. Then he hears a distant whistle. His eyes widen and he ducks out of instinct. An arrow embeds itself in his mahout's throat. Blubbering in agony, blood foaming from his mouth, the man drops to the ground with a wet crunch. F***! F***! Republican monkeys! This isn't the last you've heard from me, you shit-headed incest lovers! Yells Ajata Shattu, King of Magadha. He hops into his mahout's place and nudges the elephant to turn around. Arrows are coming fast now, and the foot soldiers who accompanied him are running away. A voice shouts from the walls. Run away, Father Killer! You could kill a helpless old man? But you'll never defeat us. We are the united lords of all the great Kshatriya clans. We will outlive your barbarian kingdom. Run for your life now, you misbegotten dog. 
Ajata Shatu refuses to look behind him or to meet the eyes of his soldiers. His generals ride up to him in chariots. He orders them to command their retreat, following the pre-planned exit routes, and to execute any soldier who dares to speak about this incident. Only then does he turn around to look at the people who dare to defy him, vanishing in the distance. The Ganarajyas of the Gangetic Plains will be destroyed, even if it takes Ajata Shaktu ten years to do it. My name is Anirudh Kanisetti. Welcome to Echoes of India, a history podcast. Ajata Shattu, king of Magadha, is a dark enigmatic figure in the history of early India. What we've just witnessed is a fictional but somewhat plausible recreation of one of the most significant events in his career. His attempt to subjugate the many oligarchies or republics or Ganarajyas and Ganasanghas of the Gangetic Plains. Sometime in the late 5th century, a time when the Buddha was already shaking things up through his popularity and his new religious ideas, similarly world-shaking things were happening in the realm of politics. And much of that credit has to go to Ajatashattu. If not for him, early India might have looked like a very, very different place. So, who the heck was Ajata Shattu? What is Magadha? And how was all this impacted by the death of the Buddha? To answer these questions, let's leave Ajata Shattu behind and fly far, far above and head. Below us, we watch the army of Magadha spreading out in a bedraggled, miserable line, slogging through muddy fields and disintegrating roads as the monsoon comes. Fading behind us, we hear the faint blast of a trumpet and the shouts of warriors charging. The Vajis are attacking the Magadhan as they retreat. Apparently, Ajata Shattu has a long and difficult journey home. We fly over gradually swelling rivers, over people toiling in fields, and gradually we see groups of monks heading ever eastwards, joining together for safety like rivers merging into the great river Ganga. As we follow these groups, we see in the distance a group of five rocky hills. Vihara, Vepulla, Pandava, Gijhakuta, and Isigili, where we heard that the Buddhist monk Vakkali committed suicide in episode 5 of this season. And between the hills, two rings of fortifications, the outer one almost 50 kilometers long, made of rock and tamped earth. Now this is a wall. Within is the city of Rajagaha or Rajagriha, known also as Giribhajja, Girivraja and Vasumati. It is the capital of Magadha and it is one of the great economic and political centers of the Gangetic Plains. Surrounded by rivers and hills, it is an impregnable fortress. In the hills and rocky crags outside the city, Ascetics have gathered for many generations, and now they are gathering for perhaps the most important gathering of Samannas ever seen in the Gangetic Plains. Because the Lord Buddha is dead, and it is time for the Samannas to decide what comes next. Nearly half a century ago, when Siddhartha Gautama had first emerged from the forest to preach his Dhamma, he could have begun at Rajagaha. It was in fact the closest major city to the site of his ostensible enlightenment, known today as Bodhgaya in Bihar. For all we know, Gautama might actually have done that, only to be ignored by the churning crowds of the much more established ascetic groups in the city. Of course, this would not have been recorded by his later followers. Gautama's journey to Sarnath, Isipatana, hundreds of kilometers away, might actually have been prompted by a need to find a place where his voice would not be drowned out. But now it is his followers who team in the city of Rajagaha, and it is their grief and anger that has the city at a knife's edge. On the side of the Vehara hill is a great cavern covered in Saptaparni creepers. It is called the Saptaparni cave, and here a multitude of monks and nuns have gathered. Look at them. There are Magadhans, Koshalans, Mallas, Kolyas, Shakyas, Lichavis. There are Brahmins, Kshatriyas, merchants, craftsmen. There are teenagers and grand elders. At their forefront stands Ananda, the Buddha's cousin. 
He stands tall, bearing his grief with dignity. Everywhere he looks, Ananda remembers his beloved teacher and friend. Everywhere he hears his voice, everywhere he is reminded of his determination and courage and wisdom. Every smile, every word, every condolence is a stab. Memory is thorn burrowing into his heart. Ananda is here because he wishes to make sure that the Buddha's teaching is preserved accurately. But a group of elderly monks stands glaring at him at the entrance to the Saptaparni cave. At their forefront is Mahakasapa, a brilliant Brahmin who was personally recruited by the Buddha, receiving the gift of the Buddha's own robes as a sign of his trust. Mahakasapa was extensively involved in teaching and spreading the Buddha's doctrines, and he sees himself as the Buddha's successor. It was he who instigated this gathering of the Sangha, he who invited his fellow senior monks to sit together and compile what they saw as the most suitable version of the Blessed One's teaching. Mahakasapa, his heavy features arranged in an expression of contempt and jealousy, speaks to Ananda. Now these, Reverend Ananda, are the bad deeds you have committed. First and foremost, you ask the Blessed One to admit women into the Sangha. Women! You allowed women to see the Blessed One's body as he was wrapped for the funeral pyre and you allowed them to defile his feet with their tears. You did not ask the Blessed One to live on forever, though he could have. The crowd rumbles in anger. People are screaming at Ananda. He opens his mouth to say something and one of his companions puts his hand on his shoulder. Ananda bows his head while Mahakasapa continues with a smile of satisfaction. Yes, yes, my brothers. How much of the Blessed One's wisdom and guidance have we been deprived of? How much less time will the Dhamma survive because of Reverend Ananda's bad deeds? And as if that is not enough, Reverend Ananda, you made superfluous remarks when the Blessed One taught his parables. You trod on his golden robe while washing it. You did not give him water when he was dying, though he asked for it. You did not ask the Blessed One about the things that the bhikkhus might forget. And when the Blessed One reproached you, you were angry and cherished ill will at him. No, Reverend Ananda, I say this as a friend. I know this to be true since I have heard it from your own lips and from those of your friends. I have the utmost respect for you, but you are too friendly with women, which means you must be in the throes of lust. Why else would anyone be friends with women? You still feel malice. I can see it in your face, Reverend Ananda, and you lack true knowledge. All the other venerable elders here, Reverend Ananda, are enlightened. How could I allow you into our company? The crowd was all on Ananda's side a few minutes ago. He was such a popular figure due to his kindness, his constant companionship with the Buddha. Ananda is furious now, humiliated by Mahakasapa's lies. Of course he gave Buddha water. It was Buddha who refused it. In fact, you can actually go back to episode 7 and check if you want. Mahakasapa had never even washed his own robes once in his life and Mahakasapa was consumed by ambition and yet he dares to lecture Ananda now. He wants him to lash out and make a fool of himself. The crowd is jeering at Ananda, using him as a conduit for their fear and anger and grief. But if Ananda does not manage to get them on his side, if he does not manage to get into the council being held in the cave, who knows what these wretched elders will choose to compile. Ananda is no fool. He begins to speak. Reverend Mahakasapa, I deny any wrongdoing. 
The crowd gasps with fury, and Maha Kasapa grins with satisfaction. He opens his mouth to say something, but Ananda speaks first. But out of respect to the venerable elders, I will accept your reproaches. You accept? I accept your reproaches, Reverend Maha Kasapa. The crowd is murmuring in confusion. A few shouts of blessing ring out. I will return to you soon, having achieved my enlightenment. Those of you who remember the wise words of the Blessed One, who remember His kindness and His compassion, come with me. Teach me what I was not able to learn from the Blessed One. Help me achieve liberation and allow me to serve the Dhamma by preserving what the Blessed One taught me. He turns and walks away, the stunned crowd parting before him. Gradually, a few begin to follow Ananda, and then more and more, nearly half the people outside the Saptaparni cave go after him. Mahakasapa stands stunned. He needs the entire Sangha on his side to approve his recension of the Buddha's sayings, and the other senior monks look angrily at him now for driving the crowd in Ananda away. They retreat into the cave, arguing. Did everything we witnessed really happen? Well, according to the scriptures of various Buddhist schools that survived, yes, absolutely. Mahakasapa did indeed call this great gathering, known to us as the first Buddhist council. It was held in Rajagaha, though the exact cave was debated, and the senior monks did indeed refuse to let Ananda in and accused him of various shortcomings. We think of Buddhism today as this perfectly peaceful and Zen religion where every teacher was a happy laughing Buddha, but the exact opposite is true. Literally within hours of the Buddha's death, as we saw in the last episode of Echoes, they were immediately at each other's throats. We'll come back to Mahakasapa and Ananda soon. Now, we also saw in the last episode that after the cremation of the Buddha, various powerful warrior clans laid claim to Buddha's ashes. They weren't all doing it out of piety though. It was competition, prestige. Do you remember Shavati, capital of Koshala, which we saw in episode 4? Well, Koshala was one of the dominant powers of the Middle Gangetic Plains, and its influence extended over many Ganarajyas and minor states. Bimbisara, king of Magadha, was married to a sister of Pasenadi, king of Koshala, who is known to us as Koshala Devi, and their son was Ajatashattu. Ajatashattu, as we saw in the last episode, came to the throne in rather murky circumstances. We don't really know what happened exactly, other than the fact that Buddhist and Jain sources claim that he killed his father Bimbisara. Now Ajatashattu is back in Rajagaha after his failed campaign, Let's listen in to some marketplace gossip about him. I heard the king was defeated by the Vajjis. And still he will never stop his wars. His father, good king Bimbisara, called him Ajata Shattu, the unborn enemy for a reason. I heard he imprisoned the king and starved him to death. Then he immediately went to war with his uncle, the great king Pasenadi of Kosala. Good thing he got thrashed. And now he is attacking the Vajjis and again getting our men folk killed. This is what happens when such impious monsters seize the throne. Brother, two coins is far too much for this rice. I can get much better rice from my cousin on the city outskirts. Sister, my brother's wife's second cousin's ex-husband became a Shakyaputta Samanna. He spoke to the great Samanna Devadatta once, who was Prince Ajatashattu's dear friend. Now Devadatta was a very great saint. According to my brother's wife's second cousin's ex-husband, he once explained to him that consciousness is a dimension. A dimension! I didn't even know mentions could die. <laughs> what a great man. Anyway, sister, the truth is that King Ajatashattu is also a very great man. It was all his idea. 
to go east and conquer Champa during King Bimbisara's reign. Don't you know? Don't you remember how many cowrie shells were given away to every house in Rajagaha after that? Now, King Bimbisara had fits during the end of his life. So, being a devoted son, Ajata Shatu ordered the doctors to take care of him. But the stupid, accursed doctors, they chained up the king to stop his seizures. Now, hearing of this, Ajata Shatu went running with a club to break his father's chains. But the king thought his own son was coming to kill him and his heart burst and he died. <sighs> now, why would my brother's wife's second cousin's ex-husband lie about what he heard that Devadatta and Ajata Shatu did? <sighs> Sister, I have to drive the bullock cart myself to go and get the rice and I must feed my family as well. Please, give me two coins. Two coins only, no. Two, please. I'll give you one. Kauri shells were much easier to buy with than these little bits of silver that King Ajata Shattu is obsessed with. What ridiculous ideas the man has. Now don't be credulous, don't swallow all this propaganda, brother. My employer is an officer in the army and I hear the truth when he speaks to his mistress. Of course, these monks and politicians will lie to us. They are all in cahoots to rob us blind and keep us stupid. But I'll tell you what is really happening. You see, the king's cousin Vidudabha, the son of the great Pasenadi of Kosala, was jealous of the Shakya Putta Samannas because all the richest men in Shavathi followed the teacher Gautama. So now that Gautama is dead, he went to war with the Shakya Republic and exterminated it. Immediately after that, he was drowned by the gods while bathing in a river and the other Ganarajyas rallied for their defense with the Vajjis leading them. I tell you that a Ganarajya is the only true way for a Kshatriya to live, not this monarchy full of spies that we live in. As soon as our king Ajata Shattu heard of Vidudabha's death, he tried to conquer Kosala. Because if he could eat his father's kingdom, what is a cousin's kingdom to him? But the Vajjis moved first and conquered a trading city controlling the Ganga river. And for the last few years, he has been trying to defeat them. On top of all this, all the Shakyaputta Samanas are here in Rajagaha fighting and gossiping about their Blessed One and Ananda and the Elder Mahakasapa. We live in dark times, don't we, brother? Huh? Guards! 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 There is a traitor here, an enemy to Magadha, spouting lies about King Ajata Shattu, the great King Ajata Shattu. Now, is all of this true? Everything we've heard accords with narratives of these politically turbulent years narrated to us by scriptural sources. Even the interpretation of Ajata Shatru's name as unborn enemy is a reference to a Buddhist tale which claims that his mother had a craving to drink her husband Bimbisara's blood when pregnant, thus realizing that her son would grow up to kill his father. That's probably nonsense, of course. Ajata Shatru, or Ajata Shatru as his subjects would have called him, is probably a title he adopted to signify his military successes because it actually means he whose enemies are unborn. Of course, our two Magadhan friends, like the monks who compiled these scriptures, had their own reasons for saying what they say and believing what they believe in. We will unfortunately never know the absolute truth, but we can try to make some guesses. Magadha was situated in modern Bihar, towards the eastern end of the Gangetic Plains. It was situated near the forested hills of the Chota Nagpur Plateau and was rich in all kinds of minerals, including sandstone, jasper, agate, copper and iron ore. Archaeology has revealed arrowheads, knives, blades, axes, chisels, rings and nails in the region. With rich red soils to grow crops in, with minerals to produce valuable goods, with hilly terrain to retreat into, and with the potential to command the lower reaches of the Great River Ganga and to use its tributaries as a maritime highway, Magadha was a powerful little kingdom. Under Bimbisara, as our Magadhan friends mentioned, it expanded east, 
thus securing the port of Champa, taking over its networks of trade and expanding its control over the entire Lower Ganga Basin. There is archaeological evidence that was from roughly this time that metal coinage began to be used widely in the Gangetic Plains, something that Magadha probably took advantage of because coins can be used to exchange far more value than cowrie shells. You need hundreds of cowrie shells, for example, to denote a certain value, but only a single coin to denote the value represented by hundreds of cowrie shells. In order to prevent public opinion from turning against them, something that we saw even the Buddha was wary of, Bimbisara and his son seem to have begun to develop networks of spies, at least, according to our friends in the marketplace. This is something that we'll return to in future episodes. Under Jatushatu, though the circumstances are murky, Magadha then moved to seize the central Ganga Basin, only to be fiercely resisted by a coalition consisting of nine Lichavi republics, nine Malla republics, and 18 republics formerly under the control of Kashi, which Magadha had eaten, and Koshala, which Magadha was in the process of eating. Think about that a little bit. It took a coalition of 36 different groups, all with their own rich histories and traditions, all with their own enmities and fears, to hold back the power of Magadha. Now, how the hell did Magadha get that powerful? We'll come back to that in future episodes. Ultimately, Ajata Shatu did find a solution to his Republican problem. According to Buddhist sources, he turned the coalition in on itself, breaking apart the bonds of trust that the republics had, swallowing them one by one. None of their histories or their constitutions or their prides or their enmities survive today. Because of Ajata Shatu's wars, Magadha was able to seize control of much of the riverine system of the Gangetic Plains, which meant it controlled most of the rivers that were used as maritime highways for trade and the redistribution of food. The foundations for India's first monarchical empire were laid. How different India might have been if it was the Ganasanghas who conquered Ajatashatru and not the other way around? Would we have seen a powerful empire based in northern India at all? But now, do you hear that terrible wailing? It's coming from the Saptaparni cave. Ananda is sitting inside with the rest of the elders. Somehow he's either convinced them that he's enlightened, or maybe he's convinced them that they can't afford to alienate him and his supporters. Now he recites what Siddhartha Gautama once preached in Sarnath, Isipatana, at the beginning of this season, but already so many worlds away. Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Illness is suffering. Death is suffering. Being with unpleasant things is suffering. Separation from pleasant things is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. Craving is suffering. It is craving that leads to reincarnation. The end of craving is the end of suffering. The monks chant after him, weeping, recording these words for posterity, knowing that they will never hear the true words of the Buddha again. Neither will we, for that matter. Not a single word that Buddha said through this season is definitively his. All stems from this retelling, this rewriting, this battle of wills and compromise between the aristocratic elders of the Sangha and the quote-unquote democratic faction of Ananda. But the first Buddhist council is coming to a close and so is our time, my friend. It is unsettling to know, perhaps, how much of history is written by victors, how much is uncertain, how often the most unscrupulous means are used to erase horror and suffering and thus justify their ends. It is unsettling to think that Ajata Shatu and Mahakashapa won substantially, and not only that they won, but that they erased their opponents from the face of the earth, leaving behind only a distant echo. And no, their opponents, the Ganarajyas and the faction of Ananda, were not perfect. They, like all systems involving ambitious, brilliant people, were full of flaws and inequalities. 
but their memory remains and they remind us that even if the monsters win that they will always be those brave enough to defy them and fight for what is right rulers tell the histories that are convenient to them i tell the histories that deserve to be remembered and thought about echoes of india has thousands of listeners for every episode but less than 20 yes 20 People support my work in recording and telling these stories. I need your help to keep doing what I do. Head over to buymeacoffee.com/acamisetti and get yourself a monthly subscription if you want more complex, nuanced and irreverent histories from South Asia. My thanks to my patrons, Srivatsa Gundala, Bharat Godihal and Sneha Gantla for their generous support. And while you're at it, please support the IVM Podcast Network as well by listening to Echoes, Yudha, and other awesome podcasts. You'll be able to find them on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Paisa Vesa with Anupam Atul Shingal, founder and CEO of Scriptbox, shares financial advice best suited for 25-year-olds. Our War and Culture podcast, Yudha, is back with season two. Check out the first episode where Anirudh and Aditya take us back to the turbulent times of ruthless warlord Timur and his descendant Babur. Also, check out what Gautam Buddha did in the final hours of his life on Echoes of India with Anirudh. Chuck, Tony, Narayan, and Shrikant break down the intriguing concept of a metaverse on Simplified. Need some help dealing with breakups? Tune in to the Say No to Drama feed and find out the alternative world Chitna has for heartbreak. And on Kill Niti, Rajiv, Rajkumar Sharma, and I as Menon analyze the lineup of the third Test match between India and England. Do follow us on social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you enjoyed this show or any of our shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to spread the word about a podcast. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week: Seat Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, Coin Switch, Kuber, and Intuit India. We really do appreciate the support. You are what makes this possible. Are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience? Are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service? And are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money? Well, your search ends here. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta and I'm host of the Paisa Paisa podcast and I invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each Monday on the IVM podcast app or the website or on any podcast streaming platforms. See you folks.